Okay, so uh, the agenda here, Brandon just welcomed this, of course, we saw it. So we're going to start out with water supply and, and saving water, which is uh, one of the things I work on. And then you'll notice that kind of a theme is how do we save water? Why do we save water? And you'll see several um, speakers are going to give us various views on how we save water and why we save water. Uh, and then as we get down into the um, later part of the presentation, we have some other programs that aren't explicitly about saving water, although everything we do has a water conservation component. For example, our uh, Matt Hively is going to talk about our work as the voice of the river. Um, Dave Westcamp talked about South Fork Initiative. All those have a water uh, quality and a water quantity theme to them. So that will uh, fill you in on that. And then, of course, as Brandon said, you know, we can't do this without you. And so we have some presentations at the end about supporting our work, communicating our work, and training uh, and mentoring the next generation of uh, people who are going to work in river conservation. So that's what we're going to do. Brandon will wrap it up uh, for us at the end. So I guess I get to go first. Um, I want to talk about the science program uh, specifically. Uh, our goals are pretty straightforward. Uh, maintain and improve wild trout populations, water uh, and aquatic habitat quality, stream flow, fishing experience as part of um, the science and technology program. We have five um, sub-programs or, or project areas within the science and technology program. Hydrology and water management uh, being first and foremost, fish need water. If you don't have water, you don't have a fishery. We start there. Of course, that water has to have uh, good quality, appropriate for trout and cold water um, uh, organisms. So we have a program devoted to that. Fisheries biology, of course, goes without saying. Social science and economics has recently, over the last, what, three or four years, become a, a really important uh, component of what we do. That's understanding our anglers. A fishery is fish plus the people who use that fishery. So we have spent a lot more time recently on um, sociology, economics, and will continue to do so. And then finally, we actually have a, a large component of our work that's the technical services and support. And we do that both for other programs within our organization, for example, Farms and Fish. Uh, some of us in the science program provide technical assistance. We do that for external partners, for example, uh, Fish and Game Department or Friends of the Teton River, a, a sister uh, non-governmental organization. Our staff that, that works specifically in the science and technology program, I mentioned Matt Hively, Jack McLaren, Christina Morissette, you'll see all of them and meet them here in person. Melissa Meradian uh, works remotely, uh, does data um, work for us and a lot of programming. I'll, I'll highlight some of her work. And then Amber Roseberry here, she won't be giving a presentation, but she's here and we'll meet her, the interns, and you'll meet all of them. And then of course there's people in our organization who work across programs, but this is sort of the, the, the group that I um, work with. Okay, I'm gonna be really brief with the water supply. Most of you are on the water report list and hear this stuff every day. So it's kind of a rerun here, but last year I started with the good news and then I went to the bad news. I'm gonna do it the other way around right now. Uh, the bad news is we have the lowest stream flow to date so far in the water year since 1935. Keep in mind, we're like almost nine months into the water year, which started on October 1st. We're not likely to make up that deficit in the next three months. So we are in a, in a drought of, you know, haven't seen in eight years. Uh, snowpack, our peak snowpack was 70% of average. It was way down there in the bottom. Most of our water comes from snowpack, started out badly. And um, so we, we had a very low snowpack this year. Winter outflow on Island Park Reservoir, that's an important feature we'll talk more about. It was pretty low, um, 220 CFS. That was whatever that is, says there, 60 some percent of average. So that was bad. So we started out badly. And this graph shows you the predicted summertime stream flow availability given the conditions on April 1st. And you can see this, this graph um, that has, um, you know, the annual stream flow. And this is in the upper watersheds because I have the longest record there that goes back to 1930. And you can see the minimum there in, in 1934. 
And the prediction at, on April 1st is that we could have been that low. I doubt we'll get there now, but that was in the cards. And certainly you can see the red uh, blocks there is what we would have predicted. And that's clear down there, 1935-ish um, flow. So things started out badly. All right, well, what's the good news? First thing is it's been three degrees colder than average since April 1st. Our temperature trend over the last 40 years has been a degree uh, per decade. So having three degrees cooler than average, that's like turning the clock back 30 years. I did my math right there. Um, so we're looking at a, at a springtime that would have been typical in the early 90s. So that's a big help. Our snowpack peaked 10 days later than average. That's a big help. Um, precipitation has been well above average since the 1st of April. So wet, cool spring. Certainly we've had it. Um, this is a graph that I, that I put in water report. I put it here because the, the blue line is our snowpack this year. And you can see, so that's why I need the, I need the five weight pointer. Um, <laughs> but you maybe a six way to do if you look all of your pointer right here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so you can see we, we accumulated a lot of snow early and then you just see a flat line from January 7th till clear into April. And then we got more snow in April than we had gotten in February and March put together. And then you can see that the peak was way out here almost on the 1st of May. So we didn't ever have a good snowpack, but we kept it on the ground for a very long time. And actually in the last couple of weeks, it's been pretty close to average for this time of year. Remembering though that we, we still had a huge shortfall in the peak amount of uh, snow that sat on the ground. So all that has delayed the need to deliver irrigation water out of Island Park Reservoir by at least two weeks from what I had initially predicted, maybe three if we're lucky. So already there's 9,000 acre feet more in Island Park than there would have been at the end of this year, regardless of what happens from here on out. So we're, we started out great. Okay. Best news of all, so last year, if you zoomed in uh, to this meeting, I, there was a quote that I actually had on a slide there. The last three years, so this was from last year, 2018 through 2020 carryover uh, was 20,000 acre feet above expected based on water supply. And I asked the question a year ago today, can we repeat that success? Well, I'm happy to report that absolutely we did. We got a fourth year in a row where Island Park Reservoir carryover was 20,000 acre feet higher than expected based on the amount of water that we had to work with. What's 20,000 acre feet in Island Park mean? How much water is that? Well, first of all, it's 15% of the reservoir's capacity. That's non-trivial. That's a good chunk of that reservoir. In fact, that's equal to the end of season carryover we saw in 2016. So we've saved the entire carryover that we experienced in the last uh, drought year. That's worth 84 cubic feet uh, per second of additional winter flow in Box Canyon. That adds about 500 additional rainbow trout to the population there each year. Um, that's on the order of, you know, 25% of a typical uh, recruit class into the Box Canyon population. So this savings makes about a 25% difference in trout recruitment. And if you do that year after year, as those fish stay in that population of fishable trout, on average, that's a 25% increase in the fish population. And Jack uh, is going to tell us a little bit about how that affects the upper Henry Sport fishery, but it turns out to be a 50% increase in Kokanee salmon run numbers in the upper Henry's Fork. And lastly, but not least, this, this one kind of gets lost a lot of times. If 20,000 acre feet less goes out of Island Park Reservoir, that's 112 CFS lower stream flow during July and August. So that actually has benefits for water quality, fishing experience, and Harriman, and et cetera, et cetera. So that's what 20,000 acre feet of water is worth. Um, so, the best news, <laughs> um, we have a, a three-prong approach to water savings. You're going to hear uh, about a couple of these today. One is precision water management, and that has to do with managing, helping our partners and agencies manage the water we have as precisely as possible to meet all 
um, needs and demands. Um, we have irrigation infrastructure improvements. Uh, we'll talk a little about that. I think Daniel's got a little bit on that in his presentation and then on farm programs, uh, which he'll talk about. So I have to acknowledge uh, two people that this spring have been making this stuff happen on the ground. Uh, Amber Roseberry there on the left and, uh, and uh, Nathan Nadal on the right. You'll meet both, uh, meet Nathan for sure here in a while. Um, there they are measuring stream flow. And the reason I say that is without the work on the ground, without measurement, without instrumentation, without functioning equipment out there in the field, it's not possible to do precision management. And Amber, is this is her third summer of keeping all this stuff running as our technician. And so she deserves a lot of credit for making this stuff happen day in and day out. And Nathan's been a big help uh, filling in for some staff vacancies and things this spring. So I have to acknowledge that. Uh, as a teaser, so that graph on the right, Buffalo River flow at Highway 20, I haven't really unveiled this yet, but Amber Nathan went out there in a snowstorm in January and it was really cold, installed the stream flow gauge on the Buffalo River. And we're now getting real time Buffalo River uh, stream flow data that will soon be on the web where people can access it. Uh, and that's just one more piece of information that we're able to use to manage the river effectively. And you'll see that nice, beautiful hydrograph response to that rain on a Sunday. You know, that's like a classic textbook uh, rain driven hydrograph. Okay, so that's uh, enough of me. So I'm gonna uh, start uh, on this question of how do we save water uh, by letting Christina Morissette kind of lead us off on the how we save water. Christina came to HFF as an intern from Stanford University in 2015. And we kept her around for another year as a research assistant. And her work was so valuable back then, I uh, figured we need to get her back here to help us with this issue of how do we save water? And it was motivated by the 2016 drought, which I think she's gonna talk about. So, Christina, it's yours. Thanks, Rob. All right, hello everyone. Um, this is my eighth summer on the Henry Sport. And wow. this is such a special place. Very happy to be here. Um, so I always start off these presentations with, well, why does the Lower Henry's Fork matter? Um, and if you've been around, you've probably heard me talk about it. If this is your first summer, I will talk about it again. Uh, so, and the reason the Lower Henry's Fork matters is because of Island Park Reservoir Management. So the Lower Henry's Fork is home to a irrigation season low flow target used by the Drought Management Planning Committee. And this low flow target is in place to make sure that we're meeting irrigation demand, that we're not drying up the river, and that we're also keeping as much water as we can in Island Park Reservoir upstream. Without this target, we wouldn't really know how much water to send downstream during the summer. And in 2016, at the time, it was the worst drought since the 1930s Dust Bowl era. And the importance of this low flow target really came into focus because it determines how much water we send out of Island Park Reservoir in the summer. And so I was brought in to figure out where should the target be and what should the target be? Because at the time, we were using this 1,000 CFS target at St. Anthony, and, uh, and we knew that it was working to meet irrigation demand. But we didn't really know what it meant on the aquatic side of things. In fact, uh, Rob was telling me yesterday that he went out during 2016 and was fishing and was uh, um, in this region and was like, I don't, I don't know if this is quite working. So um, I started my PhD project in 2018. I had my first field season in 2019. And uh, so summers 2019, 2020, and 2021, I went out on the Lower Henry's Fork and did flow measurements and habitat measurements. Summer 2020, I did habitat mapping. And then this past winter and spring, I've been putting all that data together and creating a suitability model that looks at the relationship between stream flow and habitat suitability for brown trout, rainbow trout, and mountain whitefish. And so what do we know now? Well, almost immediately we figured, we realized stream flow in the Lower Henry's Fork is extremely dynamic with diversions. So I have a line illustration for you here. So this is the Henry's Fork at St. Anthony going downstream to Parker on the left, also known as, uh, yeah, on the left, um, also known as uh, Red Road, um, the Parker-Salem Highway. And uh, we, have, we have trestle 
or railroad uh, noted in the dotted line. And then we have the, uh, the arrows are where we have irrigation diversions. And at the time, the low flow target was 1,000 CFS at San Anthony. Uh, and that was because it was a matter of convenience. There is a USGS stream flow gauge at San Anthony where you can get real time 15 minute data of what stream flow is at San Anthony. But at peak irrigation demand, these four diversions can take up to 800 CFS out of the river. And so um, if you're taking into account travel time from Island Park Reservoir, it takes 36 hours for, for water to get downstream here. Um, irrigation demand changes from day to day. Weather can impact that. That means that flow at Parker can be, I saw it as low as 180 CFS. Um, and it can, you know, it, it can oscillate and uh, I'm really a very depending on irrigation demand. So based on what I was seeing in 2019, uh, Rob and I made the recommendation to the Drought Management Planning Committee to change the low flow target to Parker and have it be 350 CFS instead. So that means that regardless of how much water these irrigation diversions are taking, the flow is always 350 CFS. And then in doing this habitat suitability modeling over the last winter, um, this reach between Trestle and Parker actually has the most suitable habitat for this entire reach, and about 60% at low flows. So in changing the low flow target to 350 CFS, you might ask, okay, so how does that change habitat in the lower Henry's Fork net, you know, now compared to the past? So I took 43 years of regulated stream flow data and put that in my model and saw that mean fish habitat in the lower Henry's Fork during reservoir draft season hasn't really changed. And then over the last five years, fish habitat has actually been much more stable during that reservoir draft season. I came onto the scene in 2019, right? And this predates me. Uh, so we can, so in 2020 and 2021, we can partially attribute this stability in fish habitat to the low flow target being changed. But prior to that, it's also a story of the precision management efforts that the Henry's Fork Foundation has been partnering with, uh, with other organizations. And so I can tell you those things, right? That mean habitat hasn't really changed and that uh, it's been really stable, but I can also show you. Uh, so this figure here is three panels. We have brown trout, rainbow trout, and mountain whitefish. Um, each panel has an x-axis with water year going from 1978 to 2021. On this left y-axis, we have weighted usable area and thousands of square meters. So how much habitat is there? And then on the second y-axis, we have the coefficient of variation, which tells you how variable that habitat is during the summer season. So um, the black line is mean habitat, the brown line is the seven day minimum, and the blue line is the coefficient of variation. And so what are we seeing here? Right, right off the bat, we're seeing this peak in the 80s, right? Um, that was just because um, they were doing construction on, on Island Park Dam. It was, a, it was a heavy water year. So there was a lot of water being moved downstream so they could work on the dam. But other than that, we're not really seeing um, any kinds of trends in terms of mean habitat. In terms of minimum habitat, we are seeing that when flow gets low, it gets, it gets low. And that's, because, and, and that's during years of high variability. Um, and so when, and so that emphasizes what we're seeing now in these last five years, that we've shrunk that summertime variability to half a percent to a percent, whereas in the past it's gone as high as 20%. So in terms of project impact, um, I mentioned earlier, right, that the USGS stream flow gauge was really helpful. It was um, a point of convenience. And so we kind of replicated that and created a convenience for managers. So Melissa Meridian and Robin Kirk uh, worked together to create a real-time uh, flow website for the Lower Henry's Fork that's actually been being used by managers daily for the last two summers, and this will, will be the third. And uh, this website shows what flow is at St. Anthony, it shows what flow is at Trestle, what flow is at Parker. So it does all the math for folks instead of having to go to the USGS um, website and then the, the, the website for this diversion and that diversion and all the way down, because all this information is publicly available. It's very conveniently available right here. Um, and then it shows uh, what the flows are relative to the low flow target at Parker, and it shows a forecast as well. This week wasn't a great week to pull a screenshot for it <laughs> because flows down there are extremely high, but I do, but I promise it does get 
down, you can see us kind of track that 350 CFS low flow target in the summer. Um, and then Rob talked about water savings. And so my project and just by the fact of moving the low flow target from St. Anthony to Parker has contributed to water savings and contributed to that 20,000 acre feet savings that we've seen. Um, moving the low flow target saved 1,200 acre feet in Island Park in 2020 and 2,400 acre feet in 2021. What does that mean? And it means that it allowed us to fill Island Park Reservoir sooner. This also benefited uh, the kokanee salmon fishery upstream of, of the reservoir, um, which, which Jack will get, get, I think get into the numbers a little bit later. But my project um, added 3% and 5.6% uh, to the kokanee salmon fishery. Uh, it is all, this island park for reservoir savings also benefits Box Canyon recruitment, um, adding 5 CFS, 10 CFS, 30 rainbow trout, 60 rainbow trout um, to recruitment in 2020 and 2021. Of course, I know that sounds small, but this is just like my contribution to the larger um, work that the Henry's Fork Foundation is doing. And then of course, um, saving this water benefits water quality. And then I am a lower Henry's Fork girl. I've spent the last three summers out there. So I have to point out that this work has benefited the stability of draft season fish habitat for the lower Henry's Fork. Um, this work could not be to be done alone. Uh, it takes three people to get to do this field work um, on any given day. And so I have to thank HFS staff and interns as well as volunteers, some of you are in this room, um, for helping row me down river and, and get the, the information I need. Uh, I also need to thank the funders of this work at Utah State, uh, the WaterSmart Grant, uh, Local Highway Assistance Council, and of course, Cooper Mount Madison Irrigation District for lending me the um, ADCP unit to be able to take these flow measurements for the last three years. And I look forward to chatting with you more at the barbecue. Uh, you're also welcome to email me or um, follow me on Instagram. Thank you. So what, what Christina showed is actually how quickly and how efficiently we implement scientific results into action. We have, she had spent one field season and figured out, hey, let's try to move this target within you know, the next what drought management planning meeting the following spring, we proposed that the irrigation district agreed to try it. And Melissa and I put that tool together right then. So they had the information. So that's sort of the technology side and son of a gun if we didn't start saving water right off the bat. And that's the numbers she showed were just from moving the target alone, not all the other things that came with it by having providing the information so they uh, the water managers have the information to actually implement the thing in the first place. Okay, so now we're gonna yeah. I have a question I want to yeah, ask forget my dinner time. In in July and August, is that minimum flow at Parker gonna be 350 yes. CFS? Mm -hmm. And at that minimum flow in July and August, will that sustain cold water fish, browns and rainbows? Yeah, um, so we've actually seen a, a decline in rainbow trout. Um, so the, the lower Henry's Fork downstream of St. Anthony is 95% brown trout, according to sure. Idaho Fishing Game. Um, and so that is another part of my research is looking at the cold water contributions of groundwater um, to the river. And so, um, but the 350 CFS does um, really benefit that pool habitat that we have between Trestle and Parker. And so, uh, there's lots of pool habitat where fish can access that sure. cooler water. But that'll sustain fish all summer down. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um, so we'll turn it over to Jack McLaren now to talk about one of the one of the reasons why we want to save water on our reservoir. Jack came here, well, he came to the Henry's work as an intern in 2015, but he was working for Department of Environmental Quality at the time. Um, then he came back in 2016 as an intern and has more or less uh, been here ever since with his master's program and then working on his PhD right now. Uh, and he's working on the upper Henry Fork, which his definition of upper is more or less what most people's is, which is upstream of Island Park Dam. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Jack. That's uh, right. Yep, I'm going to be giving an update on the um, fish habitat and fish numbers of uh, the population of different salmonids, rainbow trout and kokanee salmon. Most, I don't know, uh, significantly in that section of the Henry's Fork between the dam 
inclusive of the reservoir and the tributaries upstream all the way to Big Springs. Oops, wrong way. <laughs> All right, so just a quick outline. I'm uh, going to be talking about the importance of the Henry's Fork headwaters. Everything flows downstream. So um, we'll, I'll cover that. And then I'll uh, talk about what limits the fish and fish habitat in the upper Henry's Fork. And then um, talk about what we've learned in that regard and how that can inform and has informed uh, conservation in the Henry's Fork. So the importance of the Henry's Fork headwaters, uh, of course, it's a part of the world famous economically important trout fishery that is the Henry's Fork. Uh, and as a spring fed river, of course, with the water coming out of the ground of the fully formed river at Big Springs, it provides insurance against future drought and a warming world. Now that water is the same temperature. So this is an important refugia going forward for trout and cold water fish. And it has fantastic aesthetics. I, I think it's a beautiful part of the watershed and also has some of the best invertebrate life um, for trout in the entire watershed. Despite all of those potential benefits, it's not really living up to angler expectations. So my project is conceived around trying to figure out what limits trout and trout habitat in this part of the river. And last year at the membership meeting through Zoom, I essentially discussed how aquatic vegetation fits into that picture, about how it affects the three-legged stool of fish habitat, physical shelter, food, and reproduction that supports fish trout populations, uh, specifically about how aquatic vegetation affects physical shelter for trout against predators and their food availability. So myself and um, a bunch of the other um, people who work here at the Henry Sport Foundation did our best frogman impressions <laughs> Hopped in the wetsuits and did a bunch of snorkeling to observe trout and the habitats that they were choosing to utilize. And we found, long story short, the trout, especially the large adults, prefer deeper water, more food availability, and less aquatic vegetation for the habitats that they're selecting, that they're, that they're feeding in, their lives in fishermen speak. Um, so these graphs show the relative odds of finding a fish at any given location on the y-axis and the x-axis. For both of these panels is relative change in depth. And then these lines represent in the left hand frame here, the vegetation cover and in the right hand frame, the food availability. And the, the darker the lines mean, mean either more cover or more food available. So regardless of vegetation cover or food availability, you can see that increasing the depth even a little bit, a half a meter, just a, a foot and a half, um, greatly improves the odds of finding a fish at any given location. They like to hang out in deeper water and a reduction in vegetation cover has a huge effect in the odds of finding a fish. Uh, fish are basically selecting for areas that are like deep pools, deep runs, scour holes that don't have any aquatic vegetation. Um, and then they're within those specific habitats, they're selecting for spots that uh, provide them with a, a greater availability to find food, more bugs in the drift, uh, more food in specific areas. So individual trout, at like the individual lies, they're not like hiding in the plants themselves. They're actually avoiding plants. However, this vegetation cover that is so ubiquitous throughout the Henry's Fork, uh, both in the upper river and downstream of Island Park Dam, is really critical for creating favorable habitats. So this picture, it's underwater picture of a big clump of uh, growing macrophytes in the upper Henry's Fork. And you can see how it creates, it acts kind of like a boulder or a big log in the river. It chunks the current around it and creates these scour holes, these deep macrophyte or vegetation free locations that trout like to live in. And not only that, but living inside of the macrophyte or the vegetation clump are all of the invertebrates that trout need to eat. So uh, not directly important for fish habitat, but are indirectly important for providing that deeper water, that physical shelter against predators like us, and directly providing more food to support that trout habitat and trout numbers. So vegetation is an important part of fish habitat. However, that's not the entire story. Um, fish, so we've, I've been talking about trout habitat in the river itself. But as I said, I studied the entire system from the dam to Big Springs. 
And the fact of the matter is that most fish in the Upper Henry's Fork River are, util are primarily living in Island Park Reservoir and then migrate upstream in order to spawn. Um, so they freely move out of Island Park Reservoir and it's entirely possible and we wanted to see if the habitat in Island Park Reservoir is what's actually important for controlling fish numbers. So went out on the reservoir pretty frequently last year and we're continuing this this year. Uh, this is my uh, intern, AJ Mabaka uh, from 2021 and my girlfriend's dog, Oscar, <laughs> uh, working hard out there on the reservoir to collect a bunch of temperature and dissolved oxygen data on the reservoir to see how fish habitat evolved as the reservoir was drawn down. And then we got counts of spawning kokanee, which are a landlocked version of sockeye salmon that live in Island Park Reservoir. And we've got annual counts of these fish in the spawning tributaries upstream of Island Park Reservoir. And that provides a proxy for the total number of fish, migratory fish from Island Park Reservoir that are surviving to adulthood in any given year. And we looked to see if there was any relationship between those numbers and any number of climate or hydrological variables. So as the reservoir is drawn down from full in the spring to well, not so full in the fall, uh, nothing good happens. Um, <laughs> the annual peak in uh, kokanee count in the tributaries is on the left. And uh, you can see that there's a really strong relationship with the maximum drawdown of Island Park Reservoir uh, over the course of the two previous years. So the number of kokanee salmon, essentially what this is showing you is that the number of kokanee salmon say that are going to run to spawn this year in 2022 is dependent on whatever the maximum drawdown of Island Park Reservoir was in either the year 2020 or 2021. So it makes sense, right? These fish live to be four years old. That's the couple of years that they're confined to Island Park Reservoir. And when the reservoir is drawn down like this, we're essentially seeing a loss of fish habitat. Now this obviously isn't actual raw data, but it's a conceptual diagram is what um, our monitoring in the reservoir shows. So um, when the reservoir is full, uh, you basically have a, a tri-layered reservoir. You've got this upper layer that is warm and unsuitable for fish habitat. You've got this middle layer that is cool water, well oxygenated, great for kokanee salmon or trout, brook trout, rainbow trout, mountain whitefish. And then at the very bottom of the reservoir where the outflow is, uh, there's really poor dissolved oxygen, which is unsuitable habitat for fish. Now, of course, that's not really a problem for the downstream part of the river. It's aerated before it makes it into the actual Henry's Fork, but it is a problem for fish in the reservoir. When the reservoir is drawn down, all of this, since it all flows out of the bottom of the reservoir, basically all of this water gets sucked out of the bottom of the reservoir. And by the end of the season, there's very little habitat left. Any habitat for trout or salmon in the Henry's Fork or in the Island Park Reservoir is essentially concentrated around cold water springs, around the Henry's Fork inflow, around uh, Lakeside Lodge, if you're familiar with that kind of area. And what we think is happening is either these kokanee salmon are getting sucked out of the reservoir or they're concentrating in these very, very small areas, like 0.01% of the entire reservoirs all the habitable area there is. And they're just getting hammered by some kind of predator or they're starving to death or, or what have you. So takeaways, total number of fish in the entire system is a function of Island Park Reservoir drawdown. That's not quite the whole story because being able to catch these fish is a function of how frequently or how often they spend their life in the river where they're where they rise to insects and you can catch them on dry flies and all that good stuff, which is what I love to do. And that's a function of fish numbers, but also their spawning instinct and the quality of the habitat in this part of the river. And as I showed at the beginning of this presentation, that fish habitat is a function of that water depth and overall productivity, which is a function mostly of vegetation growth, but Another part of my dissertation is going to be asking some questions about how drought, nutrient availability, and other factors might play into that as well. So from a conservation perspective, we need to keep Island Park Reservoir as full as possible, as long as possible. Um, and then kind of stepping out and editorializing a little bit, perhaps, if we're going to stock the Upper Henry's Fork, which it is stocked, then how about some experimental stocking, habitat manipulation, and restoration? Um, 
in order to and working and if in that kind of vein working with nature working with the river itself to promote that vegetation growth and productivity which would naturally improve that habitat function so some success i, I can i can talk all day about things that we could do but we actually have done quite a bit like Rob emphasized, we've saved 20,000 acre feet in Island Park Reservoir every year. That results in about a 50% increase in kokanee salmon abundance over what we would normally expect. So to really drive this point home, in 2016, there were 780 trout per mile measured in the maximum reach by the Idaho Department of Fishing Game. And 185 kokanee salmon were counted in a one mile stretch of river that year. In 2019, after a couple of good wet years, in conjunction with saving 20,000 acre feet a year, there were 2,337 2, kokanee spawners, and in 2021, uh, 2,006 trout per mile at max in. So we've had a real and measurable effect, and uh, this is in large part because of what we do, as well as a little bit of luck as far as precipitation is concerned. So with that, just going to acknowledge a huge number of partners and all the great people that have uh, helped me with this project. Um, the names and organizations are frankly too many to, to list and we're running low on time. So with that, um, be happy to, to talk your ear off at the barbecue after this. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks. Okay, I'm gonna just kind of pick up where Jack left off with one more of these uh, questions about why we save water in Island Park Reservoir. Um, so, I don't know if you can see that's like an awesome blooming olive patch there. Maybe you can see the resolution on the screen. So another uh, um, answer to this question of why. So um, aquatic organisms um, respond to their habitat and their environment. Obviously, water temperature is really important. Uh, dissolved oxygen is really important. Other kinds of water quality parameters, conductivity, whatnot, so much stuff like that. And of course, as Jack just talked about, Christina just talked about, Physical habitat availability is really important. They have to have some habitat. They got to have water for starters, but they have to have other things that contribute to their needs that we've just heard about. So um, the data we use to, to kind of draw these conclusions about how the biological parts of the system are responding, we use stream flow and reservoir level data, obviously. Um, we use water quality data, and I got to just do the, uh, the advertising here. So on the lower right is a screenshot of our water quality data website. A lot of you know this and use it, but it is there. You can find a link to it on our main uh, henryfork.org webpage, and you can get all kinds of great data off that, uh, that website. And we archive that stuff, and then we use it for uh, various analyses, which I'll show you here in a second. Um, we And there's Melissa, by the way. I had to put, that's my favorite picture of Melissa. So that's Melissa Moradian, she's the architect of that website. She built it all by herself, one line of R code at a time. And uh, this is before Melissa had her first baby. And I just love this picture because it's like that song is her baby. I always <laughs> love that picture of Melissa. Anyway, so we obviously get fish population data, like what Jack shows. That came from one of our federal agency partners. We get uh, Fish and Game State Agency, they give us data as well. So the fish data are all, for the most part, collected by um, agencies. But we um, monitor fish ladders around the watershed, and one of them is the Buffalo River, and we have some data from that, I'll show you. And then, of course, annually, we monitor aquatic macroinvertebrates, so the insects and other critters that live down on the stream bottom, and we um, get a lot of information there. So. I'm, this is just like a total sampler of stuff we can do and are doing. We could go on for days, weeks with the data that we have. But here's just kind of, here's a cool thing um, about spring 2022. So we, we knew it was really cold this year. We knew water temperatures were cold. Well, we had the data to actually do something with this really uniquely. So aquatic insects, they respond, for the most part, the, the timing of hatches when they emerge to lay their eggs is largely driven by water temperature, and it's an accumulation of temperature over time. We call it thermal unit accumulation or degree day accumulation or something like that. You know, we've got 
we're in our ninth year of this water quality monitoring guy. Well, we got enough information to actually start to do something with it. So Melissa and I sat down and we came up with this thing and it's kind of a test version. It's on the web. We put out the link and you can go play with this thing. This is a screenshot. This is aquatic insect emergence timing at Marysville. So that's just upstream of Ashton Reservoir here. And so what we're calculating here is the timing of an insect hatch relative to average. So the blue line is what's happening this year. And basically you can see as the spring's gone on and it's just colder and colder and colder and colder, we started out a couple days behind. We're like six or eight, nine days behind average. So a given insect, if your favorite hatch happens usually around June 1st, well, you probably didn't see those things till June 8th or 9th. And I've heard evident, you know, anecdotal stories from folks that are <laughs> telling me they're seeing hatches right now that usually come out a month ago. Um, What's interesting is that orange line is 2016. We all reference that because it was the last big drought we had. Well, until last year, it was worse than 2016. But anyway, you can see what happened in 2016, super warm, one of the warmest spring, well, it's the second warmest spring on record. And at this point, the hatches are like two weeks late, uh, early, later than they would have been in 2016. That's a really extreme difference. And that's something that anglers notice. Hey, I always come on the 1st of June to fish the whatever hatch. And they may be used to what happened in 2016 because maybe that was the first time they came. They come this year and like, man, what's happening to the hatches? And this is a tool that we're building to help people understand hatch timing and other things. And we're gonna continue to do this sort of thing to help um, people who come to fish the Henry Sport adapt to changing climate conditions. Uh, and this is a, you know, this is a development tool. We're just testing this out. We're gonna have a lot more goodies like this uh, to come. <laughs> so here's another one, another cool observation from a cool spring in 2022. Here's the Buffalo River spawning run of rainbow trout. Nathan and Amber have been up there doing this since the middle of February. They go up there and count fish in the fish ladder. We've been doing this since 2006. The blue is the, uh, is it black? It must be black. The black solid line is the 2006 to 2021 average run. And it just shows you the cumulative number of fish we've caught in the spawning run. You know, starting, they start to run in February sometime and usually are done by about now. And so you can see the, the curve there and uh, most of the fish come in April. This year, we actually, March was really, March was warm. Remember like February and March was spring and then we had winter for about the last <laughs> 10 weeks. And, and so initially the run timing started a little early, but then pretty soon it got later and now we're, you know, several days later than average. It's not that much later than average because our concept of average, you know, we humans are like, well, I can remember the last few years, but it's really hard to integrate over, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. So I put 2016 on there in orange again as a comparison. Look at how much earlier the spawning was in 2016. A good week, 10 days earlier than average. And there were times, you know, where it's 10 days to two weeks earlier than this year. So great kind of stuff that we can do with the data we have. Again, this is just a teaser. There's nothing, you know, big, huge take home message here other than we are monitoring this, we're understanding this stuff and we're using this stuff to help people understand the watershed and their fishing experience. <laughs> okay, here's a, why we save water in Island Park. Um, this is the relationship between the number of age two trout that enter the population of Box Canyon as a function of the winter flow that they experience. And this is the outflow from Island Park Dam plus the Buffalo. We have some control over the Island Park part. We don't have any control over the Buffalo part. Anyway, pretty good, uh, obviously positive relationship. More water, more fish, right? That's pretty straightforward. That's why we wanna keep more water in Island Park so that there's less to fill during the winter. And that leaves us more that can flow out of the uh, reservoir during the winter to sustain fish. So I put three years on here. So 20, so there's a bunch of data since 1995. Again, from Fish and Game, we don't do this stuff. Although we help them usually, some one or two of us go out and help do this stuff. Anyway, so the blue diamond is what we observed in 2021, almost right dead on the prediction line. And the orange diamond is 2022, oh, a little lower. Yeah, we had lower winter flow. We had a drier year prior to that. Uh-oh, things are getting much worse. That I already told you last year, we had this last winter, 60% of average or something. That's what we're gonna predict 
for next year. So yeah, definitely lower this year. We're gonna have lower next year. That's strictly a function of how much water comes out of Island Park in the wintertime. But it would have been a lot worse without the 20,000 acre foot savings. So the stars um, are what would have happened without that 20,000 acre foot savings. So you can see 2021 would have been lower, 2022 would have been lower, and, and next time around would have been almost as low as we would have seen um, on in this record. So there's there's the effect of our work kind of in it's not black and white, it's like green, orange, and blue, but that's <laughs> the idea. Okay, then I'm, this this stuff is hot off the press, like last night after a few beers at the thing. <laughs> I stayed and finished this up. Uh, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how these look. Um, so this is results from now we have eight years of standardized invertebrate monitoring at five locations in the Henry's Fork. We do it the same place, the same way, every year at the same time of year. So this just orients you to the data. This is an average over that eight years. Uh, on the vertical axis here is individuals per square meter of stream bottom. That's individual little bugs. That's like the individual insects themselves. And we have five sites, Flat Rock right there, Flat Rock Club, Last Chance, it's uh, there right by the, what is that thing called? Angler's Lodge or whatever that is. Um, Osborne Bridge, right, right there between the highway bridge and the old you know, cattle bridge. Um, Ashton, that site is just upstream of the Highway 20 bridge out here north of town. And then St. Anthony is down there uh, in Christina's study area. Let's see, it's in between the third diversion and the fourth diversion, right? It's between Independent Canal and Trestle. Okay. And so, First thing to note, 30,000 individual insects per square meter. That's a phenomenal number of bugs, but it's even more phenomenal when I show you the next uh, couple pictures. And you can see that actually last chance has the lowest abundance overall um, of different insects. And Ashton has by far the highest. There's quite a bit of overlap. These just represent statistical confidence intervals. You wouldn't expect me to put something up there without a confidence <laughs> interval, would you? Okay. Um, well, that was not supposed to be there. I'm going to go to here. Uh, invertebrate density, uh, no, diversity. Okay. So diversity is a measure of the different kinds of insects. How many different kinds of critters are out there? You look at this and it's like flat rock, very low diversity. There's not a lot of different kind of invertebrates there. One reason is that the habitat, there's, it's, it's in a headwater area. There's sort of one kind of habitat which is pretty much good, clean gravel. That's pretty much what is there. As you go to Last Chance and Osborne, the river's larger. You have more different types of habitat. You have finer substrate. You got some gravel. You got some cobble. You got different kinds of, um, you got the vegetation. And so different kinds of invertebrates can live in those different kinds of habitat. And you'd expect more diversity. Ashton and St. Anthony have by far the most diversity. Again, they're farther down in the watershed. And this is completely predicted by a ecological theory that was developed back uh, in the early late 1970s and early 1980s. And this is just textbook. This is just right out of the, the, the book. Um, if you look at the percentage of what we call the EPT taxa, the Ephemeroptera, Plutoptera, Tricoptera, uh, those are the mayflies, the stoneflies, and caddisflies. We actually see flat rock. So remember it had the lowest diversity. That's because it's all concentrated in about three mayfly species, PMDs and betas dominate. They're like 50% of what's up there, pale horny duns and betas. I mean, it's just unbelievable. That figure, 65% of the insects, all invertebrates, even the worms and all that are mayflies, stoneflies and caddisflies. That's like off the charts for, anywhere, any trout stream, anywhere. I put this up against anything. It's a phenomenal number. Uh, last chance in Osborne and Ashton, a little bit lower than St. Anthony's by far the lowest. It's the farthest downstream in the watershed. As Christina said, there's a lot of irrigation influence down there, return flow, diversion, and so forth. We'd expect this. Um, this is a, a goodie called the Hills and Hoff Biotic Index. It's just a, an index of the whole water quality and habitat quality. It's, a, it's like a single index. And what you see, I just pay attention to the colors, not the numbers here. Flat rock, 
clear up in the, the excellent range. You don't get any better invertebrate assemblages than you see at the Flat Rock Club and in Jack's study reach. Then you'll see Last Chance, Osborne, Ashton, they're all about the same in the very good category. I mean, there's a reason the Henry's Fork's what it is. I mean, and this, this is one reason. And then St. Poor St. Anthony just is down there. And it's only good. Um, you know, that, that's the worst case scenario in the, in the Henry Sport. Okay, uh, a couple more things I want to say. So remember in 1992 in the fall, Island Park Reservoir was drained all the way to zero. We all, most, well, some of us remember it in person. Some of us have just like heard about it. Some of us weren't even born when this happened. Um, <laughs> Not uh, some of you. Um, so I thought, well, there's some data back there from 1993 that are comparable to our modern data. They're from Last Chance, Flat Rock, and Osborne Bridge. They're almost in the same places, same methods, same sampler, everything. And I wanted to look, well, how are we doing? And this is astonishing. I could show you a bunch of others. This is just like the take home one. Back then, after that 93 event, we were looking at on the margin of fair and good for this habitat quality index. Look where we are now, solidly in the very good. So this represents substantial improvement as indicated by this invertebrate index um, since 1993. Well, why? Tell us why. Flat rock's way above the backwater to the reservoir. Great, I'm glad you observed that. <laughs> then I don't have to say that. So the observation is this is the average of Flat Rock, Last Chance, and Osborne. Two of those are downstream of Island Park Reservoir and a third one's upstream of Island Park Reservoir. If I dug around in the statistics, the statistics work like this. There's a significant difference between the two time periods. That difference was bigger downstream of Island Park Dam, for sure. Island Park Dam, the downstream, you know, Last Chance and Osborne improved proportionally more than Flat Rock, but Flat Rock still improved. So how could that be? Well, remember part of the source of that sediment that was in the reservoir in 1992 was from the Yellowstone fires in 1988. That stuff ended up in the Upper Henry's Fork before it got into the reservoir. So some of it was deposited there. If you were around in the 80s, 90s, you probably remember Henry's Lake Flat before the Nature Conservancy bought a huge chunk of it and cattle grazed right down in the stream. There was a lot of erosion along Henry's Lake Outlet. There was a lot of sediment coming into the upper Henry's Fork. There were some water quality improvement projects implemented in the early 90s on Henry's Lake Outlet. The Nature Conservancy bought a, I don't know how many miles that is up there, it's like three or four miles of river, and got cattle off of it. Some of their neighbors did. The irrigation company, North Fork Reservoir Company, started managing better. Uh, fewer real high flows, they manage it much more uh, with a constant flow through the summer, and there's been some channel restoration. All of that stuff has reduced sedimentation in the upper Henry Fork, so it's improved. The stuff below the dams improved proportionally more, but the take-home <laughs> message is that, what are we now, 30 years of conservation with a variety of partners across the whole watershed is having a measurable effect that we can now detect because of this monitoring program. So great question, thanks for asking it. And then uh, another reason we save water in Island Park Reservoir, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit with this, there, there was a graph I, I don't know, I might have to go back and do this, I just forgot I put it in the other order. I always tell people, you know, these are samples off the bottom of the river, right? They're what we call benthic samples. And I always tell the disclaimer is, this has no bearing on your individual fishing experience on any given day, and I'm not responsible. <laughs> it's, it's not. But the, as we start to poke in this data set more and more, we start to see the same patterns that anglers have been telling me. 2020, anybody fished a ranch in 2020? And we all said, we haven't seen hatches like this since the 1980s. It was off the charts. Here's off the charts. And I, this is at last chance. This is total caddis fly abundance. Yeah, there's quite a bit of variability, but certainly look at 2020, much higher mean caddis fly abundance. The graph for PMDs, flabs, all looks exactly the same as this. So we're actually getting enough data now that we can say, yeah, what we're seeing in these 
nerdy scientific statistically valid samples actually corroborate what people are experiencing on the river. Okay, last piece here is, this is really the most exciting thing to me, which is, this is the percent of invertebrates that are the mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. This is from Osborne and Last Chance. I limited because this is specific to Operation Wild Heart Dam. The horizontal axis is the ratio of what we call the springtime freshet. We like to have a natural pulse of water moving through that river during the spring before the plants grow and trap all that sediment so it can move it out of there relative to the irrigation season flow because that's when all the sediment comes out of the reservoir and ends up trapped in the plants. And son of a gun, if we don't have, this is a statistically significant relationship here, um, the higher that freshet is relative to what's gonna happen in the irrigation season, the better our mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies do. This is the ultimate, when I started this, it was like, yeah, there's gotta be something we're gonna learn about this, and this is it. And this is yet another reason why we wanna keep Island Park Reservoir full, because that means less water out during the irrigation season. And it gives us the opportunity, if we go into the spring with a full reservoir, it gives us the opportunity that if it rains a bunch, we can deliver that freshet out of the reservoir and wash that sediment out. So this is like super, super exciting to me and just ties this back to Island Park Reservoir. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Matt Hively. He's gonna take more of a water quality and other uh, um, issue aspect to this. Matt worked for us part-time, let me see if I get this right, 2019 as a technician and he's been full-time uh, as aquatic resource coordinator since 2020 20. beginning. Yes. Yep. Cool, thanks Rob. Um, so I am oversee, I coordinate a lot of the Voice of the River work that we do. And so what is Voice of the River work? Well, it's sort of marrying this idea of the, the socio side of things and the, and the ecology side of things. Um, on the socio side of things, we look at uh, plans and permits associated with disturbances to the stream banks or the riparian area associated with development. Um, and then I also uh, spearhead like recreational issues that we might have. On the ecological side of things, um, it's everything Rob just talked about. It's the long-term data sets and building on those both biotic and abiotic factors that we use to inform uh, some feedback that we provide when permits come in, things like that. Um, but also we share that with our agency partners who use HFF as a, as a reliable resource for information. Um, so in 2021, um, briefly, you know, we were out there, we continued those data sets, just like uh, Rob uh, just laid out for us. We, we got tons of water samples for nutrient concentrations. We maintained our real-time SON network. We added uh, Buffalo River into the real-time network. Um, we did our biotic sampling of invertebrates and, and passed fish up the Buffalo fish ladder. Uh, but the big project for 2021 on the socio side of things was the floater use survey that we conducted um, at, on Stone Bridge, Warm River to Ashton, and Box Canyon reaches. Here's a picture. Um, you'll notice the stuff on the bottom. So we used a trail cam in, at the Stone Bridge reach, and this was a picture taken on 4th of July, about 98 degrees that day. I think it's plus or minus a little bit there, but... Um, so we conducted the survey from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Um, and we wanted to get at, you know, how many users uh, utilize these sections of, of the Henry Swark. And we looked at these specific sections because we identified these as the most likely to um, have conflict between anglers and non-anglers. Um, so we wanted to figure out how many Floaters used it. What was their experience? Was it good? Was it bad? Um, was there a COVID-19 response? Uh, we're seeing a huge flux, flux in, in use as a, as a result of uh, the pandemic. And then some additionals uh, like shuttle service and what kind of vessel folks used. Um, so if you saw the summer newsletter, this table was in that. So going over that, uh, we have the Box Canyon and Stonebridge. Uh, as the headers there. So total, total floaters in the Box Canyon, and this is an estimate based on our random sampling, 
uh, method, uh, just shy of 15,000 floaters um, in that summer period. And then Stonebridge, just shy of 15,500, and that was hard counts using the trail cam that we use. So that's not an estimate, that's a hard count. And yes, we counted all those people. Um, and I'll thank uh, everyone later on. Uh, floaters per day is pretty comparable, around 150 average floaters per day. Um, anglers versus non-anglers. Uh, so in the Box Canyon, we got 39% anglers versus 28% anglers at Stonebridge, 61% non-anglers versus 72. So seems to be more floaters use, utilizing that, that Stonebridge reach. Uh, identical use for shuttles, about 27% there. And then the next three, the put-in experience during that float experience and at the takeout, all very similar when we add together folks that responded with good or very good we're looking in the 90s aside from the 89 there at uh, box canyon put in and I'm, that's attributed probably to just the nature of putting in there you know a lot of folks just dump all their stuff right there to put in and people you know affects people's experience um and then down here uh, a couple more idaho users so this is just a separation of uh survey response for their zip code so um uh, more users on the Stonebridge uh, reach with an Idaho zip code, 64 versus 39% there. And then this last one here, new user, users, the users that first floated these sections in 2020 or 2021. So Box Canyon, about 32%, and Stonebridge, 41. So uh, more use, more first time users uh, utilizing this lower uh, reach. And then to expand on that, this new users, um, in this top graph is the maiden box canyon float. So the first time users used the box canyon and the bottom one is stone bridge. And you can see there's a general increasing trend, but that last bar there is 2020 and 2021. So we definitely see a response from folks out there utilizing recreation as all of us were doing in 2020 and 2021. So that's very evident here. And just point out our, our, we had a 1945 on the stone bridge. That's what they responded was their first time they ever floated. So they, they took that one. <laughs> um, and then because we have the trail cam of the stone bridge reach, we can kind of look at the variation throughout the summer uh, period. And so you can kind of see this sort of bell shaped curve here. And this peak, almost 1200 users was the 4th of July. So if you want to avoid anyone, <laughs> light fireworks instead or something. But these, these uh, smaller peaks that happen through here, these are commonly uh, holidays and weekends. Um, and then outlook looking forward. So we're, we're planning to repeat this in 2023 next year. And we're going to also include the Big Springs Water Trail, which Cam, Allison performed um, similar uh, survey, much uh, really similar to this. And we're gonna try to wrap that up in there too so we can start collecting trends over time. And we're gonna, we're planning on repeating these surveys on like a three year basis. Uh, other than the use survey, um, of course, seminal to the foundation is the riparian fences that we uh, maintain. Uh, on the left there, uh, last chance. On the right there, Wood Road 16, come uh, rain or snow, not shine. Uh, <laughs> and then also last year, we were able to uh, repair some heavily degraded H posts along the last chance um, fence line, uh, which will add a, a bit of rigidity to it, although it's not in the greatest of shape. Uh, currently, but we managed. We got it up this uh, last week. Both fences are up and looking good. Um, in response to a few reports of like some fishing violations that we had last year, we worked with the Harriman State Park and Idaho Fish and Game to design and install some signage um, to help folks. Uh, I, mostly it's new users that are sort of unfamiliar with the area, help them better fall into line with the fishing regulations. And we added this year, three or four more signs throughout the park. Um, and yeah, these are sort of strategically placed at these uh, identified spots where um, uh, violations were, were seen. 
Um, if you haven't seen Vernon, so this uh, began last fall. In the smaller picture here, um, Vernon is a gravel pit owned by the county and they went in and pressed a bunch of gravel. So we worked closely with them to disseminate some information on timelines, expectations. We worked with area stakeholders to uh, come up with a plan for parking and what kind of capacity we would need. And uh, uh, actually it's gone really well. I, if, you, if you haven't been out there, it seems to be ample parking. It's been able to absorb all the use that's uh, happening. And uh, so yeah, we continue that relationship and coordinating um, those efforts. Um, Ashton Dam is uh, about to renew their, their uh, energy license. Uh, so they're coming up on uh, their license expiring. This is like a multi-decadal uh, license. Um, and so they came and spoke with uh, the Henry's Fork Watershed Council and let us know what they're doing, what they plan on doing, give us an opportunity to talk with them, figure out uh, timelines, voice our concerns, even before the, the, the formal process happens, which was great. And so we were able to identify right off the bat a couple things. One, if a power trip happens out there, the, the gates uh, close and or flow is reduced down to about 400 CFS, I, I believe it is. And, um, and if you think about the summertime when flows are something like 1200 or 1000 or something like that, it's a pretty great uh, proportional reduction that has uh, some impacts for our uh, irrigating partners. And so addressing that was a, a pretty big item uh, that they actually already have committed to, to uh, spearheading, but then also recreational uh, capacity of like the county boat dock. Um, and so because it's a multi-decadal license, we need to be able to assume, be able to uh, plan ahead and have uh, the capacity to absorb uh, the trends of increased use in the area. Uh, lastly, we conducted our first river cleanup last year, uh, where we visited a variety of access sites, picked up tons of trash, something like seven truckloads of trash, including a couch, <laughs> uh, including a washer. Was that washer in there at Parker Salem? Uh, maybe a washer or two. Um, and then we also floated uh, Warm River to Ashton and picked up trash along either bank there depicted in the top right. Um, and then a plug, we're doing that again this year. First one's happening at the beginning of the season. The second one's happening towards the end of the season. So if you are interested in that, please reach out. Um, yeah, just in a couple weeks there. And special thanks, uh, Melanie Crawford, last year's intern, uh, played a huge role in that floater use survey. Uh, Cliff played a huge role volunteering in, in that survey and uh, a bunch of other volunteers that are, you know, uh, a huge help in all the work that we do. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Daniel or give back to Rob. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks Matt. We get back to the question of uh, how we save water. So this is part two of how we save water. Christine's was part one. Here's Daniel part two. Daniel <coughs> Wilcox uh, grew up on a farm here in the southern part of the watershed down kind of southwest of Rexburg. Uh, has a degree in agriculture and uh, what, what's the exact major? Agricultural systems. Okay, that's why I can't remember it. <laughs> uh, from Utah State University and worked in uh, implement, farm implement uh, dealership for a while, and we're delighted to have him with us as our farms and fish program manager. He's been here a little over two years, is that right? Okay, so I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel. We'll talk about the uh, farms and fish program. And while you do that, I realized I didn't plug in my power on this okay. computer. So I better do that so we don't lose power. Go ahead and I'll do this from down below here. Yeah, well, thanks for the introduction, Rob. Um, I'm excited to speak to you all today about uh, uh, our highlights for this crop season and crop seasons into the future. Um, for, uh, for an overview of the program, the Farms and Fish program consists of regional organizations working with local irrigators and agricultural producers who voluntarily implement new management practices 
with the intent to maintain quality fisheries in the Henry Stork watershed. Um, projects often are centered around alternative cropping rotation, uh, irrigation, irrigation demand reductions, uh, soil health initiatives, uh, and the adoption of new irrigation technology and introducing new markets with conservation incentives in mind. Um, Island Park Reservoir, as we've talked about several times here today, is crucial to maintaining the quality fisheries in the Henry's Fork, uh, but its mandate does not include fisheries. Uh, it's uh, must first and foremost store and deliver water to Idaho farmers and the uh, regional economic contribution of agriculture with, uh, often outweighs that of recreational angling. And uh, all of these, uh, all of those projects have one goal in common, saving more water in Island Park Reservoir. Uh, to do that, we often uh, align our goals with farmer's goals uh, to voluntarily opt into a, a project centered around uh, the past few years been centered around these uh, three criteria areas uh, irrigation deferment uh, these are land leases with the intent to decrease on farm water consumption uh, these are often centered around uh, uh, cover crop and uh, um, just uh, fouling agreements uh, winter wheat conversions do not generally uh, reduce irrigation volume uh, but it does allow irrigation to finish sooner, uh, particularly this year. Uh, the winter wheat is more established. It's a, available to take in those uh, uh, wet spring rains that we've had. And come late summer, it'll be done while spring rain still has a couple or three weeks left for irrigation season. And that's occurring when Island Park is on the drawdown. Um, and then lastly, um, implementing new irrigation technologies so throughout the watershed, you hear the term uh, precision management, and in conjunction with that, scaling that to the on-farm level uh, to help producers uh, know how to uniformly apply irrigation water to maintain that optimal soil moisture profile for uh, plant growth. Um, to be impactful this season, we started off late 2021 with a low water supply, Rob, uh, alluded to 20,000 acre feet savings that was still a below average water supply outlook. Um, continued into the winter and we, we saw a low snowpack uh, starting to develop and uh, the, the thought process where there was is that some junior water users wouldn't actually receive the full allocation of water. So we had to pivot a little bit for this year and find areas to be more impactful. And that started with soil health. Uh, we increased uh, participation in soil health driven projects. Those included cover crops and inner seedings for soil uh, for plant diversity. And uh, we, we work to get more tools in the toolbox for irrigators to make management decisions. So we had an increase in participation there with soil moisture monitors and satellite imagery. And lastly, uh, we worked with Kona Creek Canal uh, to apply for a water smart grant aimed at perpetual water savings year after year. And that's the big highlight of, of how this program starts with uh, farmer relations and can grow into a major project. Um, so I wanna highlight e each of these three, uh, I highlighted them here, I wanna go a little more in depth in each of those. Uh, so with soil health, um, it's become a popular topic among, uh, on the national scale among agricultural producers, uh, federal and state agencies, nonprofit uh, organizations like ourselves. And uh, soil health refers to the uh, biological, physical, and chemical um, makeup of the soil. And it's been documented that increased soil health will uh, provide more drought resiliency for farmers. And uh, we're, we're taking soil health tests to gather observational data that's currently being used uh, as an important source of information so that we can detect trends in the changes in, in the makeup of the soil. 
and uh, then hopefully provide a base a basis for a later controlled study if applicable. We can get some participation there. Um, modeling and scheduling, much like when Dr. Rob Van Kirk starts uh, a, an irrigation model for the for the outcome of taking into account snowpack for the water year ahead. Farmers are, are, can utilize this technology to provide a 15-day forecast for their individual farm and field uh, and, and see what exactly needs to be applied for irrigation. Um, soil moisture monitors is the area where we've expanded uh, in that, uh, providing those tools. Um, a, a soil moisture probe is inserted in the ground. Uh, it look, it's, takes readings at every four inches. Uh, this was taken, these screenshots were taken on the 15th, so just after our last big rainstorm. So they're all at 100%. <laughs> and uh, a, as we move in, in through uh, time, this is all available real time on the farmer's mobile device. Um, growing degree units is something that's mentioned in invertebrates. It's something that farmers pay a lot of attention to in uh, in crop growth. So you have accumulated growing degree units and a forecast, and eventually they get out to where irrigation is required. And that gives them uh, a, a greater understanding of, of that relationship. And lastly, um, work, work in those projects all together. They may seem small <coughs> and independent of every farm, but what they do is they drive home a big uh, relationship building between us and the farmers and they make large scale projects like this possible. This is the Kona Creek Reconnect project, which is a uh, lining of the Kona Creek Canal. Um, Kona Creek is, uh, is uh, located roughly five miles southeast of Ashton. It originates in the Teton Mountains before flowing 31 miles west in the Fall River. The irrigation uh, diversion point is highlighted there. And the service area is about 4,500 acres and it's uh, outlined in purple there. So it flows about six miles, a uh, little under six miles in open unlined canal before it actually reaches any stretch of farm, uh, farm ground to be irrigated. And uh, why, why this project? Well, Kona Creek, holds a robust population of native Yellowstone cutthroat trout uh, that has continued to decline in population since the 1970s. Uh, the canal company controls water delivery for over 4,000 acres, and that farm ground is highly valuable, highly productive, really great farm ground. Um, the canal seepage between the diversion and the spillback structure, essentially before the canal company is uh, credited for any use of that water, uh, we, we experienced 56% canal seepage in that top stretch of the canal. And uh, currently the headgate structure at the diversion point is only used for course delivery of water. It's only changed two or three times in the irrigation season. And the spillback structure, it actually just spills the water right back down to the creek. And that's controlled for more precise delivery. So instances like this spring, they got up and going, we had a wet spring. They're not really changing the diversion point. They're just changing the spill back. So that in turn is keeping water out of that stretch of Kona Creek. Um, so the project, we see it starting in three phases, begins with uh, the lining of 5.7 miles of, of open canal. Um, we're gonna establish remote control operations at the head gate and spillback diversions, uh, as well as upgrade that infrastructure uh, so that the measurements can be taken. Um, and then there's a, a, the final and third component of this is actually utilizing flow meters for the on-farm component. And um, uh, so each individual producer will know exactly how much in their shares of the canal company what they're utilizing, uh, both natural flow and storage water. Uh, to monitor the project, we'll install sond, temperature and pressure logger in the project area. We we'll utilize the ADCP, little orange instrument there, to take uh, stream uh, 
uh, or stream flow measurements, both in the creek and in the canal. Um, and that's going to start this year for the next five years. And overall cost, uh, 2.1 million was the, the first rough estimate there. Obviously, inflation has affected that. It's probably going to be closer to about 2.5 million. And uh, we anticipate uh, and have given, got notice from the WaterSmart uh, Water and Energy Efficiency Grant uh, that we will receive 1.12 million for this project. Uh, that still leaves over a million dollars worth to be raised. So big project and uh, we definitely need everybody's help to move forward with this. Uh, anticipated benefits, well, we're, we're back to this, how do we save water? Well, this will eliminate about 2,850 acre feet a year in canal seepage. It'll increase flow, in-stream flows in Kona Creek by 13 CFS in July, um, which is about 39% <coughs> increase during the irrigation season. Um, this will equate to about a savings, nearly 2,000 acre feet of storage water in Island Park. That's that good, clean, cold water that can be uh, utilized for winter flows. Um, we'll, we'll see an improved aquatic habitat connectivity ecological resiliency for water species, um, both in the Kona Creek, the Fall River, and the Henry's Fork. So all, all of that water's coming down, it, it's gonna be uh, a great thing to have, have more water in that stretch, especially during the terminal uh, stressful months of the summer, thermal stressful months of the summer. And then um, this will in turn provide a, a more reliable irrigation water for those farmers on Kona Creek canal and the that third component the on the farm component um, will increase farmer participation with nrcs conservation programs through their equip program that's environmental quality incentives program and um, that's going to be a catalyst for us in the future to to get more uh, participation from farmers and hopefully knock out some more projects like this um, so Ideally, should be starting this fall, uh, design plans in the next spring and next fall, and we'll see this continued out for, for a little while. Um, and obviously, if we can do, out, do it without the support of our membership and our partners, uh, I can't point them all out, but there's a good chunk of them right there. So um, happy to get with you guys at the barbecue. Uh, my contact information is also listed there. Feel free to call, text, email. I love the chat. Thank you. And I should point out that was a great project that illustrates uh, kind of the technical support that our science and technology staff provide for projects. Christina and I, and a couple of volunteers, if I remember, did the initial flow measurements for the canal company to figure out how much water they were losing in that, that stretch. Okay, I'm gonna introduce Dave Westcamp. He's our Southport program manager, been with us a couple of years. Dave's a fellow Humboldt State <laughs> grad. And we have a lot of um, mutual friends and uh, colleagues. Dave's worked all over the United States um, and most recently for the Nature Conservancy before we hired him away from them. So Dave's gonna talk about our Southport initiative. Thanks, Rod. Yeah, Dave Westcamp, South Fork Initiative Program Manager. Um, yeah, we've been talking about the Henry Fork and South Fork, you know, now it's, it's we talk about water savings and relationships and all of that. And I think about what we do on the South Fork has impact overall in the Upper Snake Basin. And so really trying to think about other improvements we can do on the South Fork to kind of also spread the fishing pressure across the different rivers and also just the relationships that we build. I think it gives us a better seat at the table for other conversations with uh, water users and, and bigger impact. And so um, South, Fork, South Fork Initiative, uh, as some of you may know, it's a fairly new program prior to 2018. It was just kind of a vision or an idea. And so many of the folks on the, the guys, outfitters, stakeholders, advocates for the South Fork of the state um, liked what was going on in the Henry Fork and said, we love your science-based approach and we'd like to see you take it to the next level, take that over to the South Fork of the state. And so 2018 was uh, the South Fork Initiative was adopted. As some of you may have known, Bryce Oldemeyer was in my position prior to, to me. 
um, really set the stage, drove a lot of great projects forward, and, I'm, and I stepped in with a lot of projects already moving forward and just keeping the momentum going um, and, and continuing on. And so, um, oops. And so I just wanted to give uh, just some brief overviews and updates on the, the South Park Initiative and projects we're working on. So definitely catch me after the meeting to talk in more detail. Um, and so what we're currently working on, uh, restor stream restoration projects, our water quality monitoring, very similar to the Henry's Fort, doing the same type of approach on the South Fort, uh, macro and vertebrate monitoring, outreach and education and, and partnerships and collaboration. Um, and so we talked about restoration projects. We've been really focusing on Rainy Creek, which is a tributary to the South Fork of the Snake. There's four major tributaries, Burns, Pine, and Palisades. And you can see from the slide, the huge difference in fish numbers. Um, and so that's where we're focusing a lot of our attention. These are Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Um, and so why? Um, why, what's, what's going on with Rainy Creek? And so we think about um, Rainy Creek has been manipulated historically. It's, it's had much more pressure um, from historic land practice uses. And so as a result of that, we're starting, to, we've seen um, over the years, a very over widened channel. Um, you get a very, you get a lower shallow, shallow slower water velocity, shallow depth, um, sparse riparian vegetation. And we throw riparian around. That's, you know, the, the, the wetted edge growth, right? The trees that are growing right along the sides of the banks. And so we've seen a real, uh, a minimization of the riparian growth along the streams, um, more of a straightened channel, loss of that sinuosity, um, loss of spawning habitat, for lack of better words, just muck layering over the spawning gravels and basically uh, losing a lot of our spawning gravels that trout need, um, and then just the loss of our floodplain connection. Um, and then another big factor is our uh, stream temperatures and solar loading, as Fox here represents that red is the stream channel, about two miles of basically zero existing shade. So we've lost a lot of our cottonwood um, gallery through that uh, stream reach. And so we're seeing increased elevated stream temperatures, which um, has huge impact on fish. We're starting to see, or we have seen a lot of our juvenile fish that want to stay in the system a little bit longer are exiting out sooner just because it's too hot in there. And they're moving out to the South Fork of the Snake where they're now you know, entering in a system where there's bigger fish. And so you've got competition for habitat, for food, and also for uh, predation on larger fish. Um, so I'll move into some of our uh, recent restoration projects. This is uh, Rainy Creek Bridge to Bridge Phase 1. This was just completed last January, um, right in Swan Valley proper there. If you stop at the Swan Valley General Store, um, you, can, you can see what's going on there. Um, so this is just a great compare and contrast of reach one here that was completed last January. And this is phase two that will start in October. And I'll touch on that just here in a second, but you can see the overwide channel on the upper portion there. And then the great kind of even just the aesthetically pleasing look to it. You know, you've got these nice sinuosity and deep pools. All of those are filled with uh, wood structure creating habitat. And then you've got these pool tail out ripples here. Um, just walked the stream yesterday and actually seeing trout reds in there um, as of yet, I saw them last year and we're seeing them again this year. So um, build it and they will come. It's been, it's been pretty <laughs> cool. So um, this is that lower section I just shared. Here's an up close personal photo of this. This is uh, just to give you an idea of this that muck layer there um, over wide channel. You're just, it's, it's just kind of a dead zone. And so this is a project. It's 0.36 miles. It'll extend all the way down to Highway 26 bridge. Um, and uh, very similar pattern profile to that phase one. Um, we'll have a little more elbow room to create some more sinuosity because in the upper reach there, we had you know, the, the development, but we were still able to work within the active floodplain. Um, this is another private landowner that we're working on. So a little more elbow room to get a little more creative um, on the, uh, the pattern profile on this. This is just another overview photo of that reach of phase two. This is, uh, this is where phase one ended and then working downstream to Highway 26 to give you an overview of, of that reach. Um, this was a project we just wrapped up also, um, Third Creek, Rainy Creek. At Third Creek, it's a tributary to Rainy Creek. Uh, these are just pre-restoration uh, photos. As you can see, just a graded system over wide channel. Um, and we talk about relationships. These are all built with working with local uh, ranchers and farmers and building trust and and you know, they still have the likelihood of, of running cattle. So it's getting creative to think about allowing them to still branch and make a living. So we're, we're 
we're, we're working with ranchers to actually do the stream improvements, doing riparian fencing, but then doing off-channel watering systems and solar pumping and still providing off-water systems for them to still maintain a, a, a livelihood for ranching. This is just an aerial view of uh, that Third Creek project. And so here's another comparing contrast of the upstream section that we'll hopefully be working with that landowner here shortly. Um, just uh, nice sinuosity. Um, here's our riparian fence right through here. He was generous to give us a large buffer zone in there. Um, and then we came through and planted all this with native cottonwoods and willows, um, locally sourced and also uh, with some of our um, education or our elementary school systems I'll touch on a little bit. Um, and then the photo on the right is just one of the spring heads um, that's a tributary to this third creek and just protecting that with the riparian fencing. Uh, caboose culvert is just a nickname. There's a property landowner that has a caboose on their property near it. Um, this is a culvert that's been a, a thorn in our side on Rainy Creek. It's a, it's a migration barrier. Um, and so our Rainy Creek Watershed Restoration Group, which consists of state and federal and other nonprofit uh, partners, got together and really strategizing and thinking about restoration projects. And so this is basically eliminate, not eliminating, but minimizing the amount of fish they're able to move upstream into really quality habitat on the U.S. Forest Service land, and it would open up another 15 plus miles of spawning habitat and rearing habitat. So this is a this is a next on our list to tackle, um, and then we've got three proposals submitted for the funding. INL is the Idaho National Laboratory, another um, funding source that's able to tap into, and it's looking promising. Uh, BOR is Bureau of Reclamation. That's another water spark grant that we tapped into um, to think about designs and assessments. And then JHO, Jackson Hole One Fly is a nonprofit uh, fly fishing uh, uh, event that's been a great supporter of uh, Yellowstone Cutthroat Trout Restoration Projects. That's also supporting this project. And then uh, that's that kind of wraps up our restoration. I've, I've got you know, seven or eight different projects that are in our heads that we're going to start doing designs and assessments on, but uh, we've got a really good momentum going on and really trying to tackle the lower six miles of Rainy Creek. So um, moving on to our water quality monitoring, I won't go into too much detail. Rob and others covered this quite a bit, so we're following very similar protocols, same approach that we're doing on the Henry's Fork, on the South Fork. We've got three water stations, the upper uh, South Fork Canyon stretch and the lower South Fork. Um, this is tracking real-time data. One thing that's really cool about this is also collecting turbidity. Um, and then we've got state and federal partners that are kind of relying on our data to, to look at as we see palisades this year get dropped down to low record lows and see what kind of impacts that has for turbidity issues. And so we'll be track we are tracking this real time. Um, and this is just our website that you can uh, reach us out there on our, our HFF website. Um, macro and vertebrate monitoring, doing the same type of uh, approach that we're doing on the Henry's Fork. We do this every, we've done it four years now, so we don't have quite the long-term trend we have on the Henry's Fork. Um, so we're still building that data set. Um, but as, as Rob sh showed how important our, our macro and vertebrates uh, for water quality indicators, um, our, our uh, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies, all great indicator species. So we've got three years of data and we've got our fourth year getting surveyed now and we should be back to us shortly. We can actually have our fourth year to be able to show, starting to build that trend. Um, and so what, are, what we see over the last three years, saw a decrease in total abundance, but actually um, largely due to decreases in midges and non-insects. So an increase in our EPTs um, and why thinking about more water, colder water temperatures, less periphyton. Um, and then as we think, we just, we need to keep collecting data. So building that long-term data set to actually make something of that. So um, just kind of wrapping up here, our education outreach program. We usually hold a couple of events every year at Swan Valley. Um, this year, last year, we actually connected with Madison High School FFA and the Swan Valley Elementary School. And so they're actually growing out riparian trees for our projects. And it's been a really cool program to, to work with them. And so they'll come back out in the fall and, and plant trees with us. And let's see one more thing. And then, of course, just want to say huge support uh, to the collaborative effort with all of our non, our uh, state, federal, nonprofit businesses, and all of our volunteers that come out and help us. And then, last but not least, just want to uh, showcase we've got our South Fork Gala on the 23rd in July. Vance Free, the head guide for World Cast Anglers, will be our keynote speaker. It'll be a really great event held at the Lodge of Palisades Creek. Um, see me for more details, and uh, look forward to seeing everyone there.
And with that, I will wrap it up. And I know that was a whirlwind, so please see me after uh, the event and I'll uh, be happy to answer more questions and talk more detail. So. Okay, uh, we, we've seen a couple of projects here, uh, the last two, where we've been able to get very large grants or lots of small grants in the case of Rainy Creek. And those grants would not be possible without the support of the direct contributions we get from members. Most of those grants are federal, they have a match requirement. Um, we get $1, million, $1 million from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Guess what? We have to come up with $1 million to match that. Uh, and so I'm going to turn it over to Brady to let you know um, how we work with our members and donor base to help us um, in, implement these projects, even when we get the grant money. So, Brady? Hello. Nice to see you all. <laughs> So, um, do I sound right one? Yeah, we all do that. <laughs> up is down, down is up. <laughs> okay, so the strength of the Henry Ford Foundation is you. So, we wouldn't be where we are today, we wouldn't be able to do the work that we do without you. Um, I, our membership is 2183. It's been about that for the last five years. Uh, I was kind of holding steady. 80% um, of our budget is funded directly by our members. And so the other 20% are for the very specific projects we, that you all heard about today. And the, the kind of the cool thing is, if we don't get the money for the project, we don't do the project, do we get the money? So it's, it's, it's nice that uh, the foundation is stable, it's solid. We're not chasing money to get, just because uh, we need money. We need, if, we, if there's a specific project, we will get money for that specific project. Um, and so it, it's, uh, it's hard to see organizations that, um, you know, it's easy to, to chase money um, for the wrong reasons. We don't do that. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying it very long. But we don't write grants for work we don't want to do. Yeah, there you go. We don't write grants for work we don't want to do just to get the money. So anyway, thank you, Brandon. Um, and this is because, you know, the government and corporate grant grants, it's so fickle, it's up and down. If we had to depend on that to run this organization, we wouldn't make it. And uh, there are organizations that have a lot of ups and downs because they do that. So point of this is that it's you. Thank you. Um, I've been here for 15 years, and I can tell you that the dedication that I've, I've seen from, from our members is really unmatched. Um, so uh, we appreciate that. And we do this, um, raise this, these funds from you through the Campaign for Wild Trout. It's our five-year program. And uh, I, these are programs you've heard about. And so when we ask for donations, it goes hand in hand um, with the work that we need done. So water for trout, that's one category. Um, we've heard a lot about precision water management and how successful that's been. Directly, directly more, more water, more fish, and happy fishermen. It's nice. Water quality, fisheries, value of fishing, farms and fish. Daniel does a pretty good job with that. And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And, and I guess as I'm going through this, if there's anything in here that you're really interested in that I'm talking about, you can support that very specific project. Um, so if anything in here strikes your fancy, you know, we can help you with that. So let's see. What else? South Fork Initiative, same thing. We have a we have a fund specifically for the South Fork Initiative. We want to fund that? Uh, we can we can do all of these things um, that Dave talked about today. <laughs> river access and protection. That's a lot of our um, voice of the river work. And uh, whenever we do need to secure permanent access on the Henry's work, boy, you folks stand that you just step right up. If we need to buy some properties, we can maintain access. Boy, that you you step right up for that. Thank you. Education, you know, our education program is, is very well funded, and uh, we do, you, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll hear more about that. But um, yeah, people love to make sure that the future of the fly fishing world and, and all conservation's in, in good hands. So here's our greatest funding need we heard about today, the Coney Creek Canal Project. It eliminates canal leakage, saves water in Island Park, improves fish habitat, and we got this $1.1 million grant. It's awesome, right? <laughs> it's great. 
And some people are saying, wow, you, you don't need my help anymore. You've got this big grant. Oh, no. <laughs> what Rob said is true. I mean, we, we have to match this. So it's nice. Um, but, you know, there's a heavy there's a heavy burden that we all have to carry now to make sure that we can take advantage of this of this opportunity. So um, we'll be talking about that in the next few years to to get there. So we're going to need we're going to need a lot of help. One thing I do know is that you all do help. <laughs> so that, that makes me confident that this can be done. Now, when we talk about ways to give to the foundation, sometimes we think the only way to do that is with cash. Um, a lot of you have, have um, <clears throat> done other things as well. This is just a reminder. Um, you know, sometimes when I talk about stock, it's, it's a much better conversation than this week. <laughs> <laughs> but appreciated stock is a really good way to give. You don't have to pay the capital gains on it. Um, this week there'll be less capital gains, but we still would pay less. <laughs> um, there's other different um, ways to give. The IRA charitable rollover. Um, so you can give. It's like, let's say you have to take a required minimum distribution. Has anybody heard that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can donate. You can have that sent directly to the foundation or another or another charity of your choice. I don't recommend that, but <laughs> you can send that directly to the foundation and you don't, you don't have to pay any uh, income tax on that. So we have a few folks that are doing that every year because, you know, it's amazing. They have to take it. They don't need it. They don't want it. So we'll take it. <laughs> uh, life insurance policies, uh, you know, that's another way you can give. Uh, personal property, uh, people donate boats, land, um, real estate. We have a few folks that have put their um, their property is kind of in their in their estate plan that when they, when they move on, that that uh, property will, will come to the foundation. And uh, charitable lead trusts. If you want more information on that, you can talk to our uh, estate planning specialist. <laughs> and plan giving is for everyone. <laughs> so you can do a lot now without any upfront costs, and it doesn't have to be. Just the wealthy that can do this. I mean, anybody can do this from $100 to a $1 million. We've seen all of that. So just something to think about, a way to continue your legacy um, forever. It's kind of nice. So one thing I, one thing I kind of missed, though, is don't you miss the dad jokes? <laughs> <laughs> we used to do a lot of that, you know? And I'm just thinking, that's kind of sad. <laughs> We're protected class. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so, Tom, with that, what is blue and not heavy? White blue. <laughs> there you go. You did it. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess with that, thank you for your generosity. <laughs> Jamie Watch is next to uh, talk about um, how we communicate our work out there, both internally and externally. Jamie, let's see, must have come in 2015 like everybody else did, and uh, has had several different positions here. She um, is currently Communications and Outreach Director, and she will tell you what that job entails, and then I believe you will introduce Cam yeah. um, partly through there. Thank so, you. thanks. It's down, right? It's down, <laughs> down for down. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, uh, as Rob said, I'm Jamie, Communications and Outreach Director, and I'm going to introduce Cam next. She's going to, I'm going to do the communications half of this, and she'll talk to you about the education and outreach. Um, these three programs I like to think of as the bridge between the work that we do and our members in the local community. This is how we share what we do, the impact, and hopefully give back a little bit to the local community. So there are about a million ways that we try <laughs> to reach um, our membership, anglers, visitors, and local community, like I said, to make sure that the information that they want and need gets in their hands. So everything from our, our newsletters and our annual reports for our membership, we've got a monthly newsletter, social media for folks who follow us there, our events like this one, um, our website for someone who might stumble across that. We've even been lucky enough to have articles in um, national fly fishing and outdoor magazines. And then for folks who haven't heard of us, but are out here fishing, we have flyers that go out at um, access sites so that they can find out about us and our work in those places as well. 
So just a couple of things that we're really excited about on the communications front um, this year, or this past year, I should say, we were lucky enough to get a full page ad donated to Drake Magazine. We had an article about the Farms and Fish program in Loon Outdoors online magazine. And as you can see, we, with help from a lot of you in this room and um, staff and board and even family members giving input, we redesigned our website at henryfork.org. Um, and a lot of the tools and resources that we're talking about today are available on that website, whether it's a collection of all the past reports, um, published or technical reports about the work that we've done over the last um, couple of decades, probably. The reports go back a long way. There's a nice catalog there you can read more about the history of our work. There's the water quality data website where you can check for turbidity and water temperatures in that moment while you're standing on the river. If you want to know what the water temperature is, you can look it up. We're also working on a new hash timing website. Um, so all of that is captured on our um, great new website. The third piece that I want to mention is even more exciting. Maybe. <laughs> We have a new addition to our team. So Jasper, who's been clicking photos uh, back there, is our new outreach and communications coordinator. So she's taking over youth education, um, the intern program, and she's gonna help myself and Paige with our communications. We realize more and more that some of these challenges we face are either rooted in communication or can be um, properly addressed with good and effective communication and education. So we're really trying to improve that program, expand our reach, and make this program work for everyone who loves this river. So Jasper is going to be a big part of that. We're glad to have her. Okay, I'll keep it short. Pam, I'll pass it off to you to talk about our education and outreach program. And I will take the opportunity to say that Cam was one another who came to us as an intern uh, in 2018 and has been around ever since in I don't know how many different roles. <laughs> so you have a new title and you'll have to tell everybody what that is, but right now you're in transition and we'll talk about the education outreach. Thanks, Rob. Um, I'm now the outreach and events manager. <clears throat> so if you knew Kristen going into that role, but I've been doing education and outreach over the last year and Jasper's taken a lot of that over. Um, and so I'll just go over what we did this last year, a very small portion of what we did. Um, I always like to start out with saying, while these are our structured programs, we have a lot of opportunities while just out on the river doing the work to do education and outreach. Um, a lot of our field staff um, gets those opportunities. Nathan was telling me, one of our interns was telling me recently about um, being out at the fish ladder and having a big group of kids come over and get excited about it and letting them handle the fish and then telling them about what we do. So um, these are some of our more structured programs though that I'll go over. So first off, our interpretive center that you've all had the chance to see, um, we did we made some additions to our interpretive center, a couple of digital additions. One of them was a match the hatch game where you pick the fly um, to match it to the insect. And then, Sydney Schmitter, um, one of the interns last year, created the South Fork Initiative Story Map, which is available there and also on our website. Really cool, detailed story map all about the South Fork Initiative, how it got started, what projects are going on. Um, and then that same intern also created a whole list of different ideas we have for the Interpretive Center. And as we move forward, we want to implement. So more <laughs> physical items rather than just digital that we want to get in there, like groundwater models and um, some other really neat ideas that we're um, wanting to move towards. Uh, we did a whole bunch of field trips and school visits. This is up here at Madison High School Environmental Science class. They, it's, they have like three or four periods during the day that they focus entirely on environmental science, which is really cool. So we had them come out and showed them a lot of our technical equipment, um, got them hands on with that, and then just went over some of our science programs. Uh, this was the Island Park Charter School. This is a new school in the last couple of years that they've made up in Island Park, and it's from kindergarten through third grade that came and visited us, um, and that's all in one class. So that was a really fun experience. And then I went up there um, a couple weeks later and we did a field trip up there and went out to big screen. So this is just a couple examples of the field trips and school visits we do. Um, there's a lot of schools that come and visit us here and we do lab demonstrations um, and they always leave really excited. Uh, 
I'll save that. I'll, I wanted to mention something else, but I'll wait till the intern program. So Trout in the Classroom this year, we weren't able to go in person. Um, we were waiting one more year and then next year we're going back in full force, but in the years that we haven't been able to go in person due to the pandemic, um, we provided a packet that went over a lot of the materials we would have taught in person. So we gave them an activity packet um, that had a lot of fun activities in it. And then volunteer efforts. This last year, we had a lot of volunteers. So in 2021, we had over 430 volunteer hours in total. So a lot of people came out and helped us. This is Kate Long. She's um, a volunteer from BYUI helping us out at the fish ladder. Um, this is Jeff Theobald and one of our interns last year um, up at Pine Haven and they're doing a macrophyte or aquatic vegetation study. And then this is what we like to call corn gate, where we cleaned a bunch of corn out of the river um, up at Big Springs that got dumped in the river. And we had some volunteers come and help us sort that out. Um, so that leads me into our internship program, um, which is a really big part of our education and outreach. We'll put a lot of resources and time into this program because it's um, very beneficial to us as well. So I wanted to introduce our interns this year. We have everyone here in person, which is exciting to get back to that. Um, so first off, we have Chloe Romero. It's important for the last name because we have two Chloe's this year. Chloe, will you, wherever you are, wave your hand. So we have Chloe Romero. Um, she's from Stanford. She uh, majors in earth systems. And Jamie is her mentor. Um, her project is Henry's Port Project Monitoring. Essentially, she's creating a database of all these different projects that we've either been the main partner in or led. Um, and then we're going to go back and take some pictures of those project sites, see which ones might need revisiting. And so big database that she's creating there. Abigail Lewis, will you raise? Hi, Abigail. Um, she's from Colgate University. Her major is Environmental Studies. Her mentor is Dave, so South Fork Initiative. And she's creating an access catalog. If any of you have seen the map in the Interpretive Center that's by the boat, you can click on any of the access sites that's on the Henry Fork, and it gives you a whole bunch of details about if there's a ramp, if there's facilities there, all of that. So she's doing that for the South Fork. Uh, Chloe Perel from Brown University. Chloe? Okay. <laughs> um, her mentors uh, are Christina Morissette and Daniel Wilcox. Her major is environmental science, and she is looking at the history of Henry's Fork watershed irrigation practices. So looking at um, different fields. When did they convert maybe from uh, flood irrigation to sprinkler irrigation? How is that affecting the hydrology and the groundwater resources of the Henry's Fork? Hannah Grace Galbraith, Washington University. Hannah? Uh, her major is Environmental Studies and Biology. Her mentor is Jack McLaren. And her primary project is on the Upper Henry's Fork and Island Park Reservoir. You got to hear all about that today, as well as Christina's. Um, and so she'll be looking at how fish habitat changes um, in the Island Park Reservoir as levels change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Emma Francis Doherty. Uh, she goes to St. Lawrence University. Emma, will you raise your hand? back there. Um, she majors in global studies. I am her mentor. Uh, and her project is an internship program comprehensive review. So she's also kind of creating a database going back to the very beginning in 1989 when we started the intern program um, through today and creating a database that we don't currently have of um, as many of the interns names as we can get. Hopefully the whole thing, the whole picture um, and then reaching out to some of them, seeing where they're at, who stayed in environmental sciences, who, um, how did their internship at Henry's Fork Foundation affect uh, the future, and how can we, um, what things should we continue to do, what things can we improve and change. And then our last internship that I wanted to go over, um, we normally have six interns um, every year. Don C. Byers' internship was started in 1996, um, and Don was the board chair in 1994 through 1995. Uh, Don passed away from cancer, um, and his widow Nancy and his nephew Evan presented at the first um, presented the first Byers internship uh, in 1997. Um, so this is the 25th year anniversary, and every year since then, we've had a buyer's intern. Um, 
Don's vision was essentially to involve the local youth as much as possible in the Henry Sport Foundation and in the work that we do here. Um, and so he left uh, 25000 and wanted to create an endowment fund to fund this internship or this scholarship. Um, and part of the scholarship would be that you have to do an internship with the Henry Sport Foundation. And so his family has continued that on and grown that endowment fund. Um, and I was the buyer's intern in 2018 um, and lucky enough to stay on and continue working here. Um, I just wanted to mention, let's see. Oh, and Amber, I wanted to mention Amber. She was buyer's intern right there in 2019. Um, this year, Haley Phillips, will you raise your hand? Haley, she is our buyer's internship um, intern this year. She's from BYU, Idaho. Uh, her major is fisheries, wildlife, and range ecology. Her mentor is Matt Hively, um, and she's working on fence restoration and voice of the river work. So uh, river cleanups, um, organizing the repair of riparian zone fencing, and other things, collaborating with other organizations with voice of the river work. Um, and Haley found out about the Henry Sport Foundation, correct me if I'm wrong, through her dad, who is the environmental sciences teacher at Madison High School. So one of the oh, ways wow. that we connected through education and outreach um, to have a great intern. So part of celebrating the 25th year anniversary, we actually have seven interns this year. And Nathan Nadal, who I don't think knows this yet, <laughs> is going to be the second buyer's intern. He joined on in the spring. Yeah. So he joined on in the spring to help us out when we were kind of short. Um, and he has done an amazing job with a bunch of field work. And this says water quality and strength will measurement. Those are two of the many, many things that he works on. Um, his major is fish and wildlife. His mentor is Dr. Rob Van Kirk. Um, and so as part of that celebration, we're um, having a second buyer's intern this year. And then I wanted to turn, oh, and you found out about the Henry Sport Foundation when I came and presented, correct? Yes. So when I went to BYU-Idaho for one of our education <coughs> outreach, um, just to tell them about Henry Sport Foundation and what we do, that's when he first learned about us. So just another way that um, the education and outreach program pays dividends. So I wanted to turn some time over to Evan Byers, who's here, um, and just let him kind of commemorate the 25th anniversary. And I think there's one more thing that we're doing along with that, and I'll let him introduce that. Thank you. I was down on Bonefish, 730 on the opener, and I was crying. <laughs> I went to a mall opening and I cried. <laughs> so, um, oh no, real quick. <laughs> Work with me. Okay. That's fantastic. Okay, so 25, crying now. 25 years ago, we started Elk Creek. And I think I see two people, three people. Who else was at Elk Creek 25 years ago? I was there. Oh, you were there. Yeah, I don't know. There. 25 years ago, we did, but before that, Don took me out to Third Channel. And he talked about this. And he's talked about the relationships. And he said, you're going to have a lot of people that come here to do what we do. To enjoy the beer, the spirit, the fishing, the camaraderie, everything about it. He said, but the problem that we have is we've got the people who come and enjoy it. We've got the people who live here. The people who use the water. We've all heard about how important that water is for us and for them, for the livelihood. So Don said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to start... The buyer's endowment, but it's got to be local. It's got to be local to the youth because Elk Creek was 25 years ago. I see three people here. There's a lot of us that were here, a lot of us have gone. But these kids are still going to be here. They're going to fall in right between every one of us. Okay, This man here's done a hell of a job. Okay, This guy here, phenomenal job. Where's Brady at? Where's the money man? <laughs> all right. <laughs> now, and the thing about it is they all have a purpose. They all have a job. But the bottom line is, who's out there doing all the dirty work? It's these kids. These kids that come in from St. Louis. The kids that come in from Washington. I mean, you got two Washington Lee in terms of have a successful business up there now. So they come, and they come, and they do what we do. They get caught. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not with a salmon fly. It's not with a PMD. It's with the spirit. It's about what this really is. 
And it is for the locals and it is for us. So the idea of keeping that water up, the Don's thing was get to the local kids because you don't know who mom and dad might be or who uncle and aunt might be. The foundation needs the youth to go out and say, hey, don't have three eyes up there. They're actually pretty good people. And get that cohabitation together, work together. So that was the idea is, is start that, but make it for the kids locally only. So that's where it's been. You have to be from within the watershed to be a recipient of this scholarship. So I asked Rob to kind of write down a couple things. As I watch this grow, the foundation has done a phenomenal job in, 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 in investing the money. So we got to a point now where this year I was talking to Rob and Brandon, I was like a couple of weeks ago. And I said, no, I said, no, it's 25 years. 25 years we had this idea and we did it and it's really paid off. That picture right there of the, of the uh, Yellowstone hay truck. I can tell you the story about that. That's the morning. Yeah, we've we <laughs> gone about that. Yeah. Well, anyway, but real quickly, yeah, but real quickly, I just want to say, <laughs> so I went to them and I said, okay, we got Amber, we got Cam. You know, we talked about the fencing. We have an intern that two years ago was going to fencing for everybody. So I said to them, I said, what could we do this year special? And he mentioned that you had, is it Nate? So he mentioned that Nate came up here and did all this and how he wanted to continue doing it. He has masters and want to keep on doing it. I said to him, I said, well, what could we do a little bit different this year? We've got the one intern. Where is she at? With the on. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what we do? So we said, we, we brought up Nate. And so we've decided we're going to go ahead and we're going to fund his, give him some money to work up here this year. But we're also going to make one more donation. And that's to uh, Eric, Eric Billman. Eric yeah. Billman down at BYU, Idaho. For 25 years, we watched this. I said to Rob, where are the interns coming from? And he said, Eric down at BYU, Idaho is so engaged with the foundation's doing and what the youth is doing and really trying to get the youth involved. I just said to Brandon Rob, I said, Sally, that's where we go. And that's where we go with it. So we're going to make another donation to, to help Eric out. And you put 2000 down. I need 2500 It's 25 years. 25, 25. <laughs> yeah. so, you okay with that? So we're going to do 2,500 to BYU Idaho as well to help Rob and Eric continue with what Eric's doing for you guys for the foundation. On behalf of the family, fish on. <laughs> and if you see one more thing, if you see any bald eagles flying around up there. Skim away because you don't know who's looking down on us. Yeah. Okay. So thank you all. And continue donating. Continue fighting on because we got to keep that water. We've got to have the collect. Matt, what you're doing down here is so cool. You know, getting the, art, the irrigators and farmers, we start talking. It's just, it's awesome. So anyway, thank you so much. Thanks, for Evan. All you've done. Congratulations. <laughs>